Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Julio Godinez, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, the Hidden Risks of Using Open Source Software, brought to you by White Source. We have a great webinar for you today, but before we get started, I need to go through some housekeeping announcements. Today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any part of the webinar, you will be able to access the recording for on-demand viewing. We will be sending out a link to access the webinar on demand, or you can visit devops.com slash webinar or securityboulevard.com slash webinar, and it will be available there for you. We want to hear from you, so please feel free to send, uh, send in your questions at any time throughout the program using the Q&A tab. We also encourage discussion by using the chat tab, so let us know your thoughts or just say a quick hello. Finally, stick around until the end because we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So stay tuned to see if you're a winner. And finally, joining me today is Mathieu Mensfeld, Senior Product Manager, White Source. And with that, I'm going to put myself on mute, turn off my camera, and let you begin. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mathieu, uh, and I'm going to talk today about uh, hidden risks of using open source software. A bit about me, I'm the creator of uh, open source supply chain security platform called Defend that got that was recently acquired by WhiteSource. Uh, I joined WhiteSource uh, as a senior product manager. I'm heavily involved in the Ruby ecosystem community, uh, ecosystem security, a bit less with NPM, but I'm, I'm slowly catching up with all of that. Uh, and I've been active open source software contributor at, yeah, with more than 15 years now uh, of, of contribution contributions to Ruby ecosystem. Today, we're going to talk about how open source software distribution works, what are the attacks and risks involved in using open source software, and how we can counter countermeasures, at least some of them, or maybe all of them. Uh, let's find out together. I hope to leave you with uh, a deeper underst understanding of the of the subject. Uh, open source software security shouldn't be taken lightly. We usually go with this um, trust by default approach, hoping that registries are like marketplaces where the registries themselves govern all of the code that is being published. And it's not entirely like that. So this session should help you understand risks related to using open source software. And it should give you at least a bit of knowledge how we can counter countermeasure those. So before we start, a quick introduction to what package registries are. And package registries, uh, package registry is a software package hosting service that allows you to host and manage your open source packages. So basically, if you think about RubyGems, NPM, PyPy, Maven, or many other, basically every technology has one. Uh, what is really important though, is not to confuse package registries with package registries clients. Usually they are associated one with another. That is not always the true. Package manager is a software that automates, automates the package management, but it may not be true that package registries clients are developed by the same people as package registries. It is like this with NPM, for example. Uh, NPM, all of NPM is developed by the same people uh, within the same ecosystem. But it wasn't like that for years. With Ruby, for example, we, we have rubygems.org, the main registry, and we have Bundler, the main registry client. And for years, those were independent projects. So if you decide to complain, you need to make sure to whom you're complaining. Package registries together with the package registries clients allow you to describe the state of your dependencies. So uh, usually applications are combined out of your own proprietary code. And uh, well, depending on technology, it's one or more uh, open source clients and, and registries involved. Uh, here's an example of how that works with a simple uh, Ruby plus, plus JavaScript application where you define your uh, open source dependencies for JavaScript. Uh, Yarn picks it up. Yarn is one of the clients for 
NPM and it downloads the, the software from NPM. And similarly, it, it's like that with Bunter and Ruby gems. You may use your own proprietary Ruby components from your own private registries. You can use only private registries, for example, uh, if you want or if you need. Uh, and package registries clients are supposed to figure everything out for your uh, for uh, within the context of your application. And what I mean is that dependencies may have their own dependencies, which we call transitive dependencies. I'll get back to that in a second. And they can have their own dependencies and so on. So uh, one of the main responsibilities of package registry clients is to figure out which versions uh, your application should download because it may not always be the most recent version depending on how dependencies within your dependencies are defined and how you define your dependencies. Uh, and it's a non-trivial task to uh, resolve all of the dependencies and make sure that when you resolve all of that, your application is going to run and it's going to behave as expected. Uh, 60 to 80% of average application code is, is nowadays Build with open source. Uh, we tend to build abstract blocks, and on those abstract blocks, we add more blocks of abstraction, and then we add more, and then finally, at the top of all of it, we add our own proprietary code. Uh, and on on the first glimpse, it seems really simple how open source distribution works. Uh, you're just supposed to get a package. Uh, you're, if you want to publish a package, if you have an idea, you can just put it in in a registry and you can hope that other people are going to pick it up. Uh, and there may be someone that is willing to use your package and they will use package managers and they will define their dependencies in their, the software they're developing and the registry just ships the packages. So this is how things are supposed to work. Uh, people are supposed to publish their code. Uh, to a registry and other people are supposed to download it and use it. So this is the, the ideal case. Unfortunately, it isn't like that always. Uh, there are people that for many reasons abuse this pattern and when they, when they publish packages, they sometimes publish just a shell of a package and they use hooks, uh, lifecycle hooks for, for example, before install or install to actually fetch the proper code from places like GitHub or uh, an S3 bucket or any other places. And there are many reasons to do it that way. One of them is uh, you end up with a self-updating software. Each time, you, uh, you, each time your package is being installed, the dependencies are being fetched. If they're not uh, hard linked, with a constant uh, source, you can easily update the, the data. It's really problematic for security research and security people like me, uh, because anything that can change uh, is much more problematic than uh, a constant data that is available in packages. Uh, as far as I know, all of the registries for all of the popular languages have uh, concept of immutable package versions. So you can publish a package, you can remove it if you if you want, but you cannot update the, the same version. So uh, the, 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 the thing that I described is a way to bypass that limitation. Uh, it shouldn't happen, but people do it. Uh, many of my examples come from RubyGems uh, ecosystem. RubyGems is a, it's a fairly popular ecosystem. It isn't that big as NPM, but it's still a decent one in terms of number of packages, number of releases of versions, uh, number of downloads and, and other metrics. Uh, there are many open source attack vectors. I'm going to focus only on, on a couple of them. Uh, probably one that I should pinpoint due to the recent events is also account takeovers, but I haven't had time to catch up on uh, under my presentation work because the, 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 the biggest ATOs happened a couple days ago in NPM. Uh, 
But there are other attack vectors, so I'm, I'm going to describe some of them to you this time, and maybe, uh, hopefully, next time we can have a second webinar where we can, uh, when I can present you the the other problems that the open source software is facing. Uh, so let's get started. Th there is a something we call imposter library method, and th this method aims to trick you into thinking you're using a real library. Uh, it isn't like typo squaring when we hope someone will make a typo. It's uh, rather a building a profile on a registry with a package that looks legit that you can confuse uh, with the, the package you're looking for. And that also provides you with all of the, all of the uh, needed functionalities you were looking for, right? It does not, it may not contain any malicious code. But it is there to, to get some users before a malicious code is being published. Uh, it is not only a theoretical problem because it happened uh, in February this year with, with a package called DD Tracer. Uh, it was up uploaded to Ruby Gems, uh, and it had all of the things saying I'm Datadocs client for Ruby. Uh, there was no malicious code at the time of the release, uh, but the, the releases versioning, all of them mimic the DD trace. Uh, source code of the package was the same as Datadocs library. Uh, GitHub stars were referencing Datadocs, GitHub stars and source code was referencing everything from Datadocs. So this package was basically screaming, I'm Datadocs. Uh, even the profile, everything was was trying to convince you, and it almost almost convinced me uh, that it was actually a, a Datadocs DB trace library. So here you can see an example, right? Everything here says uh, I'm Datadocs software, and the goal here is to build up a reputation and to build up a user base, uh, and only then inject malicious code. Uh, obviously, uh, a much better way in terms of getting a huge audience is uh, an ATO, but ATOs may be complex for many other reasons. While here you can build up uh, your user base and then do something shady. Uh, a second way of, of causing havoc in open source software is brand jacking. And, uh, Brand jacking is similar in nature to the imposter library, but it's showing a wider net. Uh, the idea here is to leverage inconsistencies in naming, especially with big companies that have a lot of projects and a lo lot of projects that are hosted on, for example, GitHub. Uh, but and then they have different names. Uh, on GitHub and on, and on NPM or RubyGems, for example, or, or uh, you can branch up by providing certain functionalities in the language for which a given company is that not providing an official support, right? And uh, you would think, who owns the Google API Ruby client namespace uh, in RubyGems? It should all it should be owned uh, because it's owned by by Google and, and GitHub. It should be owned by GitHub uh, and Ruby Gems. Well, you can check who owns that one. Uh, AWS SDK for Ruby the same situation. Uh, Azure SDK for JavaScript. Uh, who owns that on NPM? You would guess that uh, Microsoft, right? The problem with this is that. Programmers are lazy. They don't focus enough on reading all of the docs. Who does? They see uh, that the, there's a name on, on Google, on the GitHub. They copy paste that, they go with it. They don't read the instruction that says, hey, you need to use a different name. Sometimes uh, big companies have a single repository, but underlying there are several packages with several package names, but they're all within one namespace, let's say that way on GitHub, uh, while the official namespace is not booked uh, in, in the registries. And that's a big problem. The 
what is really interesting about this is that brandjacking may actually not target the companies themselves, like in this example, Google or Microsoft, but it is targeting uh, their customers. So if you have customers that are using your SDKs or your uh, packages that you own, make sure that there is no way that they could confuse your legit packages with, uh, with someone else's, right? If you're not uh, providing any, any services uh, in Ruby, for example, it's still worth booking the name just in case. A next uh, quite interesting factor is dependency confusion, and it is directly related to something called transitive dependencies. I mentioned that briefly uh, during the start of this presentation. And uh, well, the, in order to understand dependency confusion, you need to understand what are transitive dependencies. Long story short, dependencies of your dependencies are transitive dependencies, and you know dependencies of dependencies of your dependencies are also transitive dependencies and so on. So when you when you provide a single dependency within your, your code base, it can actually build up a quite big tree. Uh, the single package may depend on 25 packages and those 25 may depend on other packages and so on. And uh, they might depend on different versions of the same packages. It, it might get quite complex as I mentioned, but what is really important is to keep in mind that uh, there may be many levels of transitive dependencies and that resolving all of that ain't an easy job. So where is the confusion in all of that? So the confusion is either within the package manager resolution engine, package manager client resolution engine, or within uh, a proxy or a private registry that is full, that has a fallback to uh, a public registry, so basically, by publishing a package to a public registry with the same name as a as your package as your private package that is being fetched from a private registry, you can force or you can escalate a, a bug in the resolvers that are being used in registry clients, and you can trick them into actually using your version of a dependency that is uh, coming from a public registry instead of coming from a private one, right? Uh, in order to do so, obviously you need to know the naming conventions of uh, the internal packages of companies, but unfortunately some people share their uh, package files saying how on publicly, look how tidy it is, uh, this is ours. You can figure out the naming conventions in a couple ways. So once you know, or you can try guessing, uh, you can mind it. Once you know that, you can try building a package with a higher version num num number because by default, unless uh, locked heavily, which is to a pin, pin to exact version, the newer version may be preferred. And when that happens, uh, when that happens, the registry client resolution engine may pick up the, the, not the one you wanted from a private registry. And uh, Alex Brissom exploited this and described that in a great blog post. Uh, you can find that, uh, yeah, you can easily find that on, on the internet. What is really worth pointing out that when Alex started the, his investigation, uh, Defend notified us on, on, on it happening. And uh, I did tweet him on the exact day when he started. Uh, so I would say that in case of Ruby Gems, it was more because he said that he hacked two companies. It was more of a companies being researched by him because we allowed his packages to stay in Ruby Gems because Ruby Gems has a really generous policy towards uh, security researchers as long as the package is not causing any harm or is not misleading. If it's being used for research purpose, it can stay. So we we allowed it to stay. That that that's how a bug in Bundle uh, could be used, right? If we would remove those packages, we actually would never know there's a bug in uh, in Bundle resolution engine. So it, it's always a combination of of couple factors. A next one that because of this 
generous policy. Some people started to claim they are doing security research. They would put a description. I'm just doing what, what Alex did with security research. It's not uh, a malicious package, please ignore, right? And a couple of times there would be packages remote with remote code execution uh, code in them. It's not a research if you do it that way. Uh, if you uh, aggregate some basic non-exploitable data for your research, I would call that research. But if you're putting a malicious code of Bitcoin miners or remote code execution software, well, that's beyond research by by any understanding of of at least of people security people from Ruby gems. Uh, but after Alex did it, this is exactly what happened. People would publish malicious code into the registries claiming they're just doing research. So it's it's worth keeping an eye on things like that as well. Uh, at the moment, this, this number is a bit updated. We, we detected more than 500 packages and detected and reported to NPM that were malicious. Not only the, the security research smoke screen one, but also uh, many others. And we did uh, report them to NPM and they were removed. Uh, yeah, including one, not 18 minutes, but uh, today, I, I think it was like 10, 10 a.m. or something like that. There was uh, my, my last reporting for today. Uh, but there are days when my mailbox is really busy because you can mine a lot of data. You can use uh, NPM's replica server to get all of the NPM's public data. You can mine that. You can, because, how, because, because of how open this ecosystem is, not only NPM, but others as well, you can get a lot of data out of it, so you can mine stuff, and then you can automate your uh, software that releases malicious packages. And, and then, yeah, I get a lot of work to do. So I've mentioned some of the attacks, and there are many risks. Uh, it's worth pointing out, though, that not all of the risks are related to malicious activities, though. I would say that those are the most important ones, but just to mention, they're also legal, legal risks. Uh, open source is a great way into a open into a company's software supply chain. So, no companies have time to read every line of code in every package they use. No one, almost no one, does that. And projects usually start with all of the latest versions with ev of every, every dependency, they slowly fall behind, and then people start to catch up, right? Uh, but what is really important to understand that your open source software supply chain, uh, I should have placed an open source software supply chain instead of supply chain, but anyhow, your open source supply chain risks are inherited from your dependencies, both open source and closed source because of problems like dependency confusion. If you get uh, hacked, I, I don't like that word, but if, if you do, you may end up with an outage of your service. Uh, someone may use your computers, whether it's a CI, CD, uh, your development machines or your production service to uh, do crypto mining. Uh, in case of uh, developers' computers, someone may steal cryptocurrencies if there's uh, you know a wallet reference or something like that. Uh, botnets may be, may be uh, built from your machines. You may lose data, your data may leak. And there are also legal risks to all of that. Uh, and one, one thing that wasn't mentioned, uh, if, you're a com if your company is providing software services to other companies, your compromise may actually propagate to those companies, right? Let, let's say you build uh, a software that is being distributed as Docker containers, right? If I can get your Docker uh, Docker registry keys, I may be able to publish my own version five minutes after you published your one for your customers, right? And if someone is refer re referencing the latest of their Docker container, well, they may have a pretty big problem. What is worth keeping in mind is getting access to production environment is not always the goal of the attackers. And I would say that it, most of the time recently, it is not the goal of the attackers. Uh, here's an example of a, of a 
encoded uh, snippet from a JavaScript where all of the environment variables are being stolen and they're being sent over the wire, right? So as I mentioned with the Docker example, if you store AWS keys, uh, if you uh, have SSH keys, uh, if you have any other keys, uh, GitHub keys or any, any stuff like that in your environment in which you run install or update or, or execution processes for your development with your open source components, you may end up having a really big problem. Installing packages is enough to make things bad. So you don't have to run the software. You just need to make a single mistake of installing software. And to be honest, possibilities are endless because you basically give away all of the execution permissions uh, from the user under which you're running the code. And most of the people that do not use uh, things like Docker containers for software development just run from the from their own user, uh, which is basically like saying, hey, here's my computer, do whatever you want with it. So how we, how we can protect ourselves from, from threats like that? Obviously, the, the best code is the code you, you didn't have to write. So if you don't use a computer, no problem, right? And uh, of course, that's a joke, but uh, Hoshitaka Sakurada from a previous picture it used to be a minister of cybersecurity who confessed that he doesn't know how to use a computer. So you can try doing that. But to be more serious, one of the things would be um, limiting your reliance on open source components. And sometimes if, if you look into components, uh, both for Ruby and, and NPM, and, and JavaScript ecosystem, you may notice that some of the libraries, uh, unless obviously those are transitive dependencies, uh, but some of the libraries are just implement five or 10 lines of code. It may be not worth adding dependencies like that if you can quickly implement some simple functions by yourself. Uh, limiting reliance on packages that are not well maintained or are not maintained for years may also be a risk. Uh, but there is no general solution to, the, to all of the problems. Uh, you should use only verified package sources. So if someone is shipping some sort of packages from their own registry, that's probably not the best idea to rely on those. Uh, just first of all, because the, the, the level of control that the community, open source community has on, on, on a private registry is much lower than uh, for public registries, second of all, they can go down and you may have a really big problem. Obviously, some could argue that uh, for public registries, someone could unpublish uh, a given package and so on, but it's still easier to solve than relying on a package from a private registry, public package from a private registry that just disappeared. Uh, you should shift left with your security, which means, uh, you need to stop threats as soon as possible. Uh, and ideally, before developers have a chance to even use given packages. Uh, you should watch watch out for typos coding and friends. They happen, uh, and they happen quite often. You should never assume uh, blindly an ownership of a package in a registry. What you see on GitHub, GitLab, or any other uh, source code sharing place, and we, what you can see on registry may not be the same. You can have a, a release with legit code on, on GitHub and a malicious code in NPM. It happened a couple of times. So never blindly trust uh, what you see on GitHub and don't, don't go with this assumption that what you see on GitHub is one-to-one -one on what you see in a registry. Uh, revisit your packages and make sure that you don't rely on abandoned packages. And if you do rely on abandoned packages and they're mission critical for you, you should probably take them over. Uh, one thing that I should mention, if you're a package registry, if you're a soft open source developer and you're releasing packages to registries, enable 2FA 
it's not always going to help, but in many cases, uh, it would basically stop the, the, the threats from happening. So enable 2FA for both uh, a web panel and a CLI if the registry is providing one. Do not use new packages. Some of the attacks uh, are crafted in a way where there's a new package being introduced, a new package containing a malicious code, and within a legit code, that got, for example, that author got, author's account got taken over, there's just a package reference, right? And unless someone is uh, tracking all of the content of all of the dependencies and figuring all of that out, if they are scanning only the package content, then you're gonna see only a new dependency, right? So never use 30 new packages. Give them a week or two weeks. Uh, Report any unexpected behaviors you notice or any inconsistencies or problems to package owners. Uh, connect critical CV notification to your on-call duty setup. Uh, never install packages without running uh, an assessment on who's the author, if the package is being maintained, how popular is it, how fast and how frequently bugs and problems are being fixed and and all of the normal assessment you should do for any software uh, you're going to use for your business you should always think before you update uh, and you should always make sure that uh, you understand what is the scope of the changes you're uh, you're allowing to come to your system if you use uh, auto updating dependency tools like renovate set them up to have a delay on on updating uh to the newest versions let's say at least a day a week would be the best obviously for some cases you may want to overwrite that if there are bugs that are affecting you but in general that's a really good practice to have a certain back of uh back of, back of policy do not use do not inject the same environment, all of the environment data into a CI CD pipeline. I mean, try to end up with a CI CD with isolated steps. That way, even if you get compromised, at least not all of your environment variables are being uh, stolen. Educate and your developers and make sure they do understand the criti criticality of the problem. Uh, keep in mind that what you see on uh, places like GitHub, GitLab and, and friends, uh, and what you see in registries may not be the same stuff. Uh, please try to use white source different because we aim to, to tackle that problem. Uh, so as a summary, trust no one, don't go with this uh, trust by default approach uh, to using open source software. Update dependencies when you're sure of the content, track changes in the development process uh, for your open source dependencies, be aware of your environment. Yeah, run CI in isolated stages. Uh, obviously, match the security flow and requirements based on your organization profile. Take care of your whole software development life, life cycle. And yeah, give a white source different a try. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I would be more than happy to answer any questions if you have any. Excellent. Uh, all right. It doesn't look like we have any questions, but uh, in the meantime, I just want to remind everybody that today's webinar has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the webinar, you'll be able to watch it again. We will be sending an email with a link to access the webinar on demand, and you can also find it on DevOps.com. Uh, just look in the on-demand section in the webinars page, and it should be there. Uh, and now to announce our four Amazon gift card winners. Our first winner is Dave B. Congratulations, Dave. Our second winner is Johan K. Our third winner is Wilfred R. And our final winner is Natalia C. So congratulations to our winners. We'll be reaching out to you via email with instructions for claiming your Amazon gift card. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see it there, uh, check your spam folder. 
Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Matche for taking the time to put this presentation together. And I'd also like to thank the audience for their time and engagement. Uh, this is Julio Godinez signing off until next time. Thanks, everyone.